Welcome to Church Online. I am so excited that you have joined us this morning. I'm Pastor Matt. I pray that our worship will be exciting and uplifting. I pray that the ministry of the Word will work in your heart and that the Lord will do something special. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the service. Good morning, Bethlehem Church. Hey, it's great to be here um, this morning. I really appreciate the invitation, Pastor Matt, to be here. Uh, I appreciate the amount of time you gave me. I, the Ravens game kicks off at 105, right? So, I mean, I've got like over an hour to work with here. Um, no, I, I will, uh, I'll, I'll try to, to be as uh, brief as I can. My dad is pastor. He gave me some advice a long time ago. He's like, let me give you some advice about preaching. He said, uh, stand up to be seen, speak up to be heard, and shut up to be appreciated. So, Tried to stick with that of like, okay, we'll say what we need to say, and then when we're done, we're done. Uh, but let me let me give you a little bit about myself and this weekend, what we're trying to do, and then we'll jump into the message this morning. So my name is Nate Skelly. I live in Pensacola, Florida. So if you know where that's at, this is a panhandle all the way at the end. It is basically like living in Alabama, but you still are in Florida. Um, my wife, Charity, she actually plays uh, piano keyboard for our church worship team, and we... At our church, they sang the uh, new name written down in glory. They sang that song this morning, so that was kind of cool to, to hear it here. Uh, we have three kids. Jaden is seven, Judah is five, and Juliet is three. So that's uh, that's our family. We've got three, and we're sticking to that. That is our story. We're good there. Um, but we have a lot, a lot of fun with uh, with those three. Um, here's what we're going to do this weekend, and here, here's kind of... Um, my plan and, and, and my, my hope for all of this. This morning, we're going to preach a message from the Bible, what the Bible has to say about the topic of finances. Tonight at 6 o'clock, and I hope you'll come back for it. Raven's game is going to be long done, so come on back at 6. We're going to do just very practically personal finances. You're spending, you're saving, you're giving, you're investing. We're going to talk about just really helpful, actionable items that you can implement in your personal finances. So it'll be a very, very different type of thing tonight, so I hope you can come back for that. And then uh, Pastor Matt mentioned this. If, if there is some of some or a few of you that would like to uh, speak with me just one-on-one -on -one, uh, and, and, and kind of ask some, some money questions that you have, I'd be glad, glad to give you some, some input, some recommendations, and help you as much as I can. I'll be around uh, tomorrow morning if that works for your schedule. So if that sounds like something that would be helpful, just see me afterwards and we can, we can get that taken care of. So um, I will readily admit that every time I come to a church, and especially on a Sunday morning, I have a message about finances. I know there may be a visitor or a few visitors in the room, and I know what you are thinking now. You're like, aha, I went to visit the church, and guess what? They're talking about money. I knew it. I knew they would talk about money. I, I From what I know of Pastor Matt, I, I know he is not a, a guy that every message and every week is just money and give. And I understand that sometimes when it comes to the church context and can be a little bit uncomfortable talking about money because it's a very personal topic, right? But it is important for us to talk about money within the church because the Bible speaks about it. The song that we sang this morning, A New Name Written Down in Glory, we talk about we're a new creation in Christ. If, if we have come to know the Lord as our Savior and we're now a follower of Jesus, that means that he has some things to teach us about life and he has a new way he wants us to live. And uh, how many of you understand that, like, we don't put church in a box, right? That's what this whole series has been. This is the fourth Sunday in the series of church life. Church is not just a box that I check on Sunday. Like, I, I, I get on my church clothes, and I, I put on my church face, and I put on my church uh, language, and I go to church, and I do that thing, and then on Monday, then I'm myself. And I go to work, and I go take care of the kids, and I take them to school, and I... No, no, God wants, to, wants us to be transformed in the way we live our lives so that Sunday all the way through Saturday and the next Sunday, we're the same person. Whether we're in church, whether we're at home, whether we're at the workplace, no matter where we are, we want to be transformed. And that includes, yes, our marriage and our parenting and our workplace and our friends, and, but it includes even our finances. Jesus, in the Gospels, you read the Gospels, notice how often he talked about money and personal possessions. He talked about it a lot. In fact, he mentions money more often than he does heaven or hell or prayer or faith. And it's not because money is more important than those things, but Jesus understands that money shines a light. It exposes what is truly important 
in our lives. And I want us to look, first of all today, I want us to look at Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 19. I'm going to look at a lot of different passages this morning, so I will be jumping around and just fair warning, but this is going to be the really key passage for us to launch this message from in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 19. It's really important because within churches today, we got a lot of churches all across this country, and, and can I be honest with you for a second? Not all of them actually teach what the Bible has to say about finances. It's unfortunate, but it's true. There's a lot of Christians that have fallen into this trap of thinking that if I'm just a good Christian, and if I have faith, and I give generously, then God is going to automatically bless me financially. I will have a raise at work. I will be able to drive a nicer car. I will live in a nicer house. I will wear nicer clothes. I will have all of these things because I live for God. And folks, I'm here to tell you that that idea, the prosperity theology, prosperity gospel, sometimes we call it that, that's not true. Okay, look at John the Baptist, look at Paul the Apostle, look at Jesus himself. There are many people in the Bible that lived a godly life that were very poor. God does not promise health, wealth, and prosperity just because you're a follower of Jesus. But on the, on the other side, like on the other extreme, there are some people that have this attitude of like, well, if you're a real Christian, if you're a good Christian, you would never have money. You wouldn't have nice things. You wouldn't have any wealth. Because if you did, that would show that you are shallow, that you are materialistic. But folks, the Bible doesn't teach that you can't be a Christian and also have money either. Look at Abraham, look at Job, look at King David. Many godly people in the Bible were very wealthy. So I don't know how you feel about yourself this morning as far as whether you would describe yourself as being very rich or very poor. Maybe you say I'm middle class, I'm working class. However you feel about your personal finances this morning, just understand this, it's not an indication of your godliness. Your net worth doesn't tell us anything about how close to the Lord you are. Some people God has blessed immensely, and others really struggle. Some of the people that will be sending shoeboxes here to in just a couple months live in very poor areas of our world and have next to nothing. That's not an indication of whether God loves them more or less than us, or where God, God is, you know, where they're more godly or less godly. No, no, no. God gives some a lot, God gives some a little. But what he's looking for is what we're going to do with what he has entrusted us with. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Jesus is speaking here. This is the Sermon on the Mount. He says to the crowd gathered, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Hey, guys, don't make your life about material possessions. Don't make your life all about money and stuff because... That gets rusted, it gets moth-eaten, it can get stolen, it can go away like that. It's very temporal, very shaky. Instead, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. So don't make your life about stuff that can go away and be taken from you that's temporary. Make your life about things that are permanent, something that's going to last forever in heaven. That's what you should spend your, your attention and your resources towards. And then I don't want you to miss this. Verse 21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Here's what Jesus understands. Your heart and your money are inextricably linked. They're like two magnets stuck together. Wherever one goes, the other will automatically follow. Whatever you spend your money on, that is what you will care about. And whatever you care about, that is what you will spend your money on. My dad's a pastor. I mentioned that. Um, By the way, folks, uh, I'm in Pensacola. I come from Pittsburgh. That's where I grew up. But I want you to know that I am not a Steelers fan, okay? So you are allowed to continue to listen to me. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Like all good Christians, I cheer for the Dallas Cowboys. But that's another thing uh, altogether. My dad would say this. He would say, show me your checkbook, and I'll show you your priorities. Show me your checkbook and I'll show you your priorities. If you are younger than me, a check is, it's a piece of paper that you can actually, you pay people. Okay, if you want to update that, your credit card statement, your bank statement, show me where you're spending your money and I'll show you what's important to you. It goes hand in hand. It's inextricably linked. This is what Jesus understands about our money and this is why it's so important for us to talk about it in a church context because if we want to live for the Lord and we want to follow Jesus with our lives, then he has some things to tell us about how we use our money. Two foundational principles we have to understand this morning that will unlock the key to having joy and fulfillment 
in our personal finances. Principle number one, if you want to write this down, ownership. Principle number one is ownership. Our money belongs to God. Did you know that this morning? Your money belongs to God. You say, hold on a second, but my name's on the bank account. How does that belong to God? Well, God is the creator God. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Job 41 11 says, Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. Everything that we see, everything that we experience in this life is only because of God and because God made it. So it's all his. Now you say, okay, I get it, Nate. Like, like God created the world and the universe and like, but I went to school and I applied for this job and I put in the hours and it's my skill and my time. Like, but I earned my money. So it is still mine. Well, hold on a second because the Bible also says in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18, you shall remember the Lord your God for it is he, God, who gives you power to get wealth. 1 Samuel 2, 7 says, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. So before we start beating our chest and saying, yeah, my money and my, hold on, who gave you the skills that you have? Who put you in the place that you live? Who gave you the opportunity? Who? It's all God. And just like he's given it to you, it could be taken away from you tomorrow. So before you get lifted up with pride and thinking, oh, it's all mine. No, it's God's. It belongs to him. And understand this, God also doesn't need our resources. Sometimes we think, well, you know, I, I come to Bethlehem Church and, you know, I, I'm a very big giver here and I support this church uh, very strongly financially. And if I were to go somewhere, I mean, they'd really be hurting at Bethlehem Church. As if God is in heaven this morning looking at the offering and saying, oh man, Gabriel, how was the offering at Bethlehem Church today? Because if it wasn't high enough and if that person, that big giver didn't give, then I don't really know what I'm going to do. Now, God is, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is creator God. He doesn't need your or my resources he needs us to acknowledge that it all belongs to him. So ownership, but secondly, we have to understand the principle of stewardship. Stewardship. Not only does our money belong to God, but we are the managers. You know, that's what stewardship means. To be a steward is to be a manager. To be entrusted with something that's not yours. If you go to Walmart, you go to Olive Garden, and, and you need to talk to somebody in charge, do you talk to the owner of that company? No, you talk to the manager. It's not their company, but they've been entrusted to oversee that location. That's what we are. God has given us his resources, and they're in our hands, and we're the decision maker now. But we're accountable. We answer to the true owner. We see this in Matthew chapter 25. For sake of time, I won't read the entire passage, but there's a very famous parable of the talents. Maybe you've heard that uh, parable before. In Matthew chapter 25, there's a story of a rich man who's going away on a long journey, and he has three servants. He calls them to him, and he says, I'm going to give each of you a different amount of money to manage for me while I'm gone. One, he gives five talents. In today's terms, be like millions of dollars we're talking about. Another, he gives two talents. Another, he gives one. And then he goes away, and, and while he's gone, the first servant takes his five talents, and he doubles it, makes very shrewd business decisions, and doubles the master's money. The second one does the same. He takes his two talents, doubles it to four. But the third is very cautious. He's very uh, unsure about, because uh, you know, he feels like his boss is a very demanding and very high standards kind of guy. And he's like, I just don't want to mess up. I don't want to do something dumb. So he, he buries that money in the ground. He finds a place, digs, buries that money in the ground. And when the master comes back, then he says, okay, time to give an account. So the, thir- the servants come to him And the first servant says, look, master, I've doubled your money. And the second servant says, look, I've doubled your money. And he says, well done, thou good and faithful servants, and and commends them for the job that they did. Then the third servant comes in, and he says, well, listen, boss, you know, I know you're a very demanding guy. I know that you have very high expectations. I didn't want to mess up. I buried the money in the ground. See, I didn't lose a penny. All of your money is safe and sound. Here you go. And in that parable, the master says, you are wicked, and you are lazy, and he casts him out. And he takes the one talent that had been entrusted to him and gives it to the guy with five. And you read that story and you're like, hmm, that seems a little bit harsh. Like, isn't that an overreaction on the part of the master? Why was he so upset with the third servant? Well, obviously it's a story. It's not a true story, but it's a parable to teach us the truth. Who is the master? Who is the owner? It's God. And who are the servants? That's us. God gives his servants different amounts of resources But it's not all the same. One, he got five. One got two. One got one. Did you know this morning you have not been given the same resources that everybody else has been given, right? And the master doesn't expect the same results from everybody. Did he expect the guy with one talent to go make five talents? No. What does he expect? He expects faithfulness. 
And the problem we have sometimes is we think, well, I'm the one with one talent. Yeah, you know, Pastor Matt is so gifted, and he's so energetic, and he's such a great people person. Like, yeah, of course God, of course God has high standards for him, but I mean, who am I? I'm just a nobody. I don't really have much. I don't have a lot of money. I don't feel like I have a lot of skills. So it doesn't really matter in God's eyes how I use my time and how I use my skills and how I use my money because I don't have a lot. The story of the talents tells us, no, 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 that's the wrong attitude entirely. It's not about how much have I been given. It's what am I doing with what God has entrusted me with? Am I a good manager of his resources? Luke chapter 16, Jesus puts it this way. He says, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in, a li- in very little is also dishonest in much. In other words, what you do with the little tells me what you'll do with a lot. Some of us think, well, the, the reason I'm not doing a good job is I just don't have enough yet, right? I mean, I, I can't be generous, but if I won the lottery tomorrow, oh, I would be so generous. I would help so many people. I would do- Hold on a second. If we can't be faithful with a little, why would God give us more. In fact, he says there, in continuing that passage, he says, if then ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, if you've not been faithful with just money, temporal riches, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Folks, let's ask ourselves the question this morning, based on how I'm doing right now, should God give me more? If God had to kind of take a little bit of an evaluation this morning and say, how are you doing? How are you doing with your time? How are you doing with your your gifts and your talents? How are you doing with your finances? Are you managing them well? Should God be uh, see fit to give you more, or is there still some work to do? I, I I don't know. It's a sobering question. So, let's go back to Matthew chapter six and verse twenty one. God's the owner. It's all His money, and we're the stewards. We're the manager. It's in our hands. We get to make the decisions. But if you're a good manager, whose opinion should you care about? The owner, right? It's him you're supposed to please. It's him you're accountable to. It's him that you are going to give an answer to. And what is the owner? What is the master? What does he say? Well, Jesus tells us, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Spend your money, use your money, use your resources on the things that really matter. And what really matters in life? Is it the temporary stuff? Is it living for today? Or is it eternity? Is it others? How do we lay up treasure in heaven? That's an interesting question. Jesus says lay up treasure in heaven. How how do we do that? I didn't see a first bank of heaven on the way in. Like, where, where do we go to make that deposit? Do you know how we invest in eternity? Do you know how we lay up treasure in heaven? We're generous. We give. We give of our time. We give of ourselves. We give even of our own resources. And when we do that, the Bible teaches We're laying up treasure in heaven. I love what Randy Alcorn says. He says, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. When you die, the bank account, the 401k, the house, the car, all of it goes to somebody else. You're not taking any of that with you into the next life. But when you give, when you're generous, when you help others, you are making an investment in eternity. So point one, and I want you to know, now that we've hit point one, we have not reached our cruising altitude. We have begun our descent, okay? Point number one, giving is an act of worship. Jesus teaches us to be generous. He says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. But when we give, a very interesting thing happens. We are actually, when we give, we are worshiping the Lord. Did you know that? We entered into a time of worship in the beginning of the service. We had a time of prayer. By the way, Pastor Matt, I, I have to say, that was the first double false start I've seen in a prayer. Uh, the Ravens game is coming up. That was two five-yard penalties back-to-back. I, I have never seen that before. We, we, we come to the Lord in, in a time of prayer, right, in, in song and worship. But did you know when you give, you are also worshiping the Lord? Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, Paul writes to the church at Philippi, a church that had supported him financially. He says, I have received full payment and more. I'm well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. So, so they sent him money. He says, I got it. Epaphroditus gave me the money that, that, you, that you sent. But he says this, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. You know, Church of Philippi, that gift that you gave me, yes, it helped me to do the things I need to do, but really in God's eyes, it was like the incense that gets, that's offered at the temple. It's like a, a sacrifice offered on the altar. In God's eyes, it was worship, and he received it as such. 
In Matthew chapter 2, we find the wise men as they went to uh, uh, present their gifts to the baby Jesus. It says, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him. And how do they worship him? It's interesting. They opened their treasures. They offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. This was their way of worshipping their Messiah, worshiping their King. You are so precious in our in our sight that we want to offer to you these great gifts. When we give, we worship. All throughout the Bible, we see this pattern. We give God what's first and give God what's best because he has that priority in his life. You see, Abraham, he offered uh, tithes all the way back in the Old Testament to Melchizedek, the first 10% he gave. The Israelites in, in, the, in, the, the, uh, in, in the ancient kingdom of Israel, what they would do is they'd take the first fruits, the first of their crops, and they would uh, give that to the worship at the temple. Uh, if you wanted to offer a sacrifice, you didn't just pick any lamb out of the flock. You picked the best lamb, the spotless lamb. The firstborn child had a, 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 a priority status. They would be the ones that would be dedicated to the Lord. The firstborn would receive a double uh, portion of the inheritance from their father. And uh, I told the early service this. I will tell you this. My dad is a pastor, and I am the oldest child. And I have, I've shown him that passage about the firstborn getting the double portion, and he's still not reflected in his will, so please pray for him that he will be obedient to the Bible in that area. Giving is an act of worship. We give God uh, our best, our first. Secondly, giving is an act of faith. Giving is is an act of faith. When we give, we're demonstrating that we believe God's word to be true. Because let's face it, let's, let's think logically for a second this morning. If the Bible is not true, and God is not real, then all of this money and time and attention and things that you do for other people, why are you doing it? Don't, don't give $10 to send a shoebox overseas. Don't decorate your trunk. Take that money, use it for yourself. Because you get one shot. If that's... If the Bible's not true and God's not real and we're just here for a, a limited amount of time and then we die and it's it, lights out, curtains, game over, then what are we doing, right? But we don't believe that to be true. We believe that there is a life yet to come. We believe that there is a God who created this universe and created us uniquely in his image. And we say, because I believe that to be true, I'm going to, by faith, step out and say, I'm going to take something that I could use for myself and I'm going to use it to help others because I believe God's word to be true. It's an act of of faith. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul writes to Timothy, his protege, a young pastor. He says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, to be proud, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Folks, we're Americans. Do Americans set their hopes on riches? Oh, yes, they do. Oh, I, I'm good. Bank account is, is fine, fully stocked. 401k is great. But when we start to trust our money, the economy, our job, you know what happens? We are on very, very shaky ground. And Paul says, don't hope in those things. Instead, on God, who richly provides us everything to enjoy. And what should we do if, if God has blessed you? And by the way, we live in America. We live in the richest country in the world and the history of the world. And so maybe by American standards, we're not rich. But by world standards, by history standards, we are rich. What should we do? That they do good, they be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. You know what God says? If you've been blessed and we have, then use it for good. Help others. Be ready to be generous, ready to share. And then, don't miss this part, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold on that which is truly life. When you help others, when you're used as an instrument of generosity in the life of somebody else, you're laying up treasure in heaven. Proverbs 19, 17 says, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will pay, repay him for his deed. Isn't that an inter interesting thought? That when you give, when you're generous, you're lending money to the Lord. You think he's good for it? Yeah, I, I think so. I think he'll repay you with interest, right? So giving is an act of worship. Giving is an act of faith. And then thirdly and finally, giving is an act of love. Giving is an act of love. And, and this is, to me, this is the most important of the three. Why do we give? 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 8, Paul is speaking to the Corinthians and he's asking them to give. He's taking up an offering for the, the saints at Jerusalem. They're poor, they're struggling. He says, I want you to give. Corinth, uh, Corinth, you're a rich church, I want you to give. And he says, I say this not as a command, you don't have to, but to prove the earnestness, uh, by the earnestness of others, 
that your love is also, also is genuine. I want you to prove how much you love your brothers and sisters in Christ by giving to them. And then he says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Hey, folks, I want you to give. I want you to help. You don't have to, but it would be a great way to show that you love others and remember what Jesus did. He's the one that we follow. He's our example. What, what did he do? He was rich. He was seated at the right hand of the Father, and he gave all of that up, and he came to earth, and he lived a perfect life, and he died on a cross, and he did all of that. He became very, very poor for us so that we could be rich, so that we could enjoy heaven with him forever, so that we could have eternal life. And if he did that for us, and he loved us, and he gave, then that's what we should do for others. John 3.16, probably the most famous verse in all the Bible, says this, God so loved the world that he what? He gave. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's what God calls us to do. To love, and that love motivates us to give. Let me, let me share with you a quick story. Uh, this past summer, my family and I, we were in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And if you don't know anything about Gatlinburg, it's, it's basically the Las Vegas for, for Christians because it's like a big tourist area, but it's a lot of family-friendly stuff. And... Um, so we were there, and, and I mentioned I've got younger kids, and so you know we were doing a lot of like the the mini golf and the go karts and the arcade. That's where we spent a lot of our time. And so we were at the arcade the one day, and it was it was interesting because I guess it's just been a long time for me to go to an arcade. They don't give you tickets anymore, and you, there's no tokens. It's all on a, like a card, like a like a preloaded card. So you put the money on the card, you swipe the card, and then even the tickets. Like when we played the game, I'm like, where are the where are the, the tickets didn't come out. Well, I'm getting ripped off here. And, the, the people are like, it's on the card. It, it's, it's okay. So I, I calm down. Um, no, but, but the, um, the so, so you, you play the games, and then afterwards, you know, depending on how you did in the games, then on your card is a certain number of tickets. You can go up to the desk, and you can redeem it for prizes. You can get candy and little plastic toys that will be lost in the, between the seats in the car in one day. But you, know, you, you go and get the toys. So, so we're done. We've played all the games. We're standing in line waiting to redeem. And it was kind of a longer line. There were a lot of people there that day. And so we're just waiting. And I noticed there was a family getting ready to leave. And they were about to walk out the door. And the, the, the mom, she stops. She sees us with our kids. She comes over says, hey, uh, we have some tickets on this card, but we got to go. You just add this to whatever you have. And we're like, oh, man, thank you so much. This is very kind of you. And, and I got to thinking about that interaction because it makes sense, right? She realized something. Okay, I'm going to leave this place very soon. I don't have time to use these tickets. And as soon as I get in my car and drive away, I can't use it for anything else. They're not going to accept my tickets at Walmart. I can't put gas in my car. It's going to be worthless to me. So why don't I give it to somebody who can use it even after I'm gone, they'll still be able to benefit from it. Folks, that's what Jesus has called us to do. We have something of value, but it's limited value. It's only good for a certain amount of time in a very specific place. And as soon as we hit that exit door, it does us no more good. And so Jesus says, instead of holding on to it, why don't you learn to give it? Why don't you learn to help others so that even after you're gone, long after you're gone, there will still be people benefiting from your generosity. Let me close with this. Uh, this is something that, that God's allowed me to go to churches just like yours and speak and have a weekend where we focus on finances. And I had a real treat that a few months ago I got to go back to my home church in Pittsburgh where I grew up. And I, I haven't been there for five years now. And it's a new building. I say new. It's, it's probably 10 plus years old now, but newer building, not the church where I grew up and as a kid. 15 years ago, yeah, just about 15 years ago, we had a capital campaign because we needed to build a new church. We just didn't have the space. The facility was old. It just We needed to build a new church building, and it was going to take a lot of money to do that. And so we talked, we, 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 we organized, and, we, and I remember very vividly as a teenager sitting in services and we talked about, hey folks, we're going to give, and some of you are going to give very sacrificially, but we're doing it for a reason. Because one day there's going to be a place and an auditorium and a facility where there's going to be people that are sitting there that are not here today that will be there. And their lives will have been transformed by Jesus and their families will be there worshiping. Maybe there'll be restored marriages. Maybe there'll be renewed relationships between children. There'll be all these great things that will happen 
But we can't do all of those things yet because we need the facility to be able to do it. And so people gave. They gave very, very generously. We built the building, and it's there today. And I stood in it a few months ago, and I looked out on a crowd of faces that many of them I did not recognize. People that were not there a few years ago. But they're there now. And they're growing. Their lives are being changed, and they're impacting their community, and they're doing great things. And many of them maybe don't even realize what it took to get them where they are right there, right, right then. There's a lot of people 15 years ago that gave very generously that are not there today. Now, folks, I've been really excited. Pastor Matt shared with me some of your story, how this church got started a few years ago and how you got into this building and the great things that God is doing here. Can I tell you this? 15 years from now, there's going to be some new faces. And some of these faces, some of you, you won't be here. You'll have moved on to something else, perhaps. But God's work goes on. And you're going to be part of something. You're going to, send, you're going to give money to send shoe boxes overseas, and you're going to do a trunk or treat, and you're going to give to make sure that this ministry continues to thrive. But there's going to be people years from now that will continue to be blessed and be benefited because of your generosity. And that, friends, is what God calls us to do to love and to give. I'll close with this. I think it's there on, on, on your piece of paper. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. If you love your church, if you love your community, if you love your Lord, you're going to want to give because that's what he did. Thank you for watching and joining us for our church online. I pray this experience was just what you needed today. If you made a decision for the Lord to follow Christ, or if the Lord did something in your heart that was special today, we would love to hear about it. Post it in the comments, send us a message, and we'll reach out to you. Have a wonderful week, and God bless.